Let's imagine and visualize the precision of the 32-bit floating point format. If you have trouble visualizing what I'm about to say, I'd encourage you to check out the video on visualizing the floating point format. Link in the description. So in it, I concluded that large numbers are stored less precisely. They are thinly spread out and far and few in between. As the magnitude of the numbers decrease, the precision gets better and the least count gets finer. As you reach the bottom of the range, the difference between consecutive numbers gets smaller and smaller as they get ever so close together. Most of the representable floating point numbers appear close to the origin on a number line, and only a small portion of the representable numbers appear outwards. Obviously, the same is true on the negative axis as well. In fact, there are the same number of floating point numbers between 0 and 2 as there are from 2 to the maximum floating point number of 3.4 times 10 to the power of 38. This boggles the mind. Visualizing this is so difficult. This illustration is not to scale, and it just can't be. That's because we've been looking at it on a linear scale. Let's see what happens when we convert it into an exponential scale. Here, the numbers are represented as powers of 10, from a minimum of 10 to the power of negative 38 to 10 to the power of positive 38. And we can see that the number 2 is somewhere here, between 10 to the power of 0 and 10 to the power of 1. And now the original statement that there are the same number of floating point numbers between 0 to 2 as there are from 2 to the maximum floating point number makes a lot more sense and gives a lot more clarity. So clearly, the floating point numbers are logarithmically arranged. But there's one striking problem with the statement I just said. The first range I mentioned was between 0 and 2. Where is the number 0 on this scale? Well, you can't find it. It's an exponential scale. You can keep going down lower to zero, but you'll never quite reach there. A non-zero number raised to a power of anything can never be zero. The best you can say is that it tends towards zero. Well, at this point of time, you might be asking, well, what's the point of any of this? What does this have to do with subnormal numbers? There exists a chasm between the lowest representable floating point number and the number zero, a chasm that our number format can never represent values in. The number zero itself is a special condition within the floating point format. It's not even part of the floating point range. So none of the floating point rules apply to the number zero. It's a specially handled case with its own set of rules. Also, the exact same thing happens on the negative axis as well, when the sign bit represents the negative numbers. There's a chasm or a void between the lowest negative number and zero. If you look at the scale, it's discontinuous. There's no continuity between the positive range of the scale and the negative range of the scale. The format of numbers is discontinuous, with a little tiny island of the number zero that we've introduced for the sake of mathematics. This is where subnormal numbers come in. Their purpose is to bridge this gap, to fill the void, so to speak. Okay, interesting. But why do we need to fill this gap? What's the motivation for doing this? We'll take a look at two numbers here. The minimum representable floating point number, which is basically the lowest normalized number, and then the number right after that, which is basically going to be the second lowest normalized number. Since these numbers are really small, and based on the fact that the smaller the numbers are, the more precisely they're stored, you can see how small the least count is going to be between them. The numbers are different beyond the seventh decimal place, and the exponent of the number is already 10 to the power of negative 38. Subtracting these two numbers will actually give us the least count. But what happens when we do subtract these numbers? Let's calculate the precision of this window of numbers. This will be the lowest possible precision within the normalized range of the floating point format. If you try to print this out, we get zero. Clearly, the precision will be lower than the lowest representable number as a float, far lower than how are we supposed to represent this? How would we store the result of this subtraction operation? Based on what we know so far in the floating point format, 
we've just hit an underflow condition. Any value lower than the lowest floating point number is flushed to zero. Let's see what the actual precision is though. To see this, we can just cast these numbers into doubles, which operate at 64 bits of precision, and then find out that way. Well, you can see that the precision value is quite small. It's uh, 1.4 something times 10 to the power of negative 45. Though the answer is technically not zero, y you could say that flushing these numbers to zero was fair enough because these numbers are so small. But too small for whom? We might think it's small, but a mathematician or a, a scientist may not. Treating arbitrarily small numbers as zero could ruin the integrity of calculations and could result in unpredictable and undefined outputs for different input values. I apologize in advance for having tricked you a little here. This is a, this statement here is a cheeky little flag that I've enabled. What it does is it flushes to zero. It flushes any number lower than the lowest normal number to zero. Going into the actual details of this, it's a, it's a processor specific flag. This particular flag can only be used within the Intel SSE architecture. And it's within the XMM intrinsics header. Enough of the details. All it does is if it's lower than the lowest normal number, it flushes it to zero. Let me actually disable this. And the disabled state is the default state. Let me run the program again. As you can see, we are able to represent this really tiny number, which is lower than the lowest normal number inside the floating point format. These are basically subnormal numbers. So what the subnormal numbers guarantee is that addition and subtraction of unequal floating point numbers never underflows to zero. Two nearby floating point numbers always have a representable non-zero difference. Let's look at how subnormal or denormal numbers are implemented. We've got the floating point format with the sine, the exponent, and the mantissa. How do we represent the magnitude of the lowest floating point value? The sine is unimportant here. The exponent has to be 1, which represents an exponent value of negative 126. The exponent cannot be 0 because it's reserved for special conditions including the condition to represent the number as zero itself, where both the exponent and the mantissa fields are zeroed out. Okay, back to our lowest representable float. The mantissa can be zeroed out. This means the number represents 1.0, since the one before the binary point is implied. We get a normalized representation of 1.0 times two to the power of negative 126 in binary which is 1.175 times 10 to the power of negative 38 in decimal. All good. But there's still a reservoir of numbers that we haven't utilized yet. When the exponent drops down from 1 to 0, we trigger the special conditions, yes, but there is technically 2 to the power of 23 bit states of the mantissa within this window that are unused yet. One of them, of course, is used, uh, and it's to represent the number 0, and so we can use the rest of the 2 to the power of 23 minus 1 states to bridge the gap between this number and the number 0. We can't keep the normalized form here with one point in something. If we do that, we're just adding another level of precision down and not solving any of the problems. So we have to take the 1 off here and represent the numbers as is with 0 point something. And we can see from the illustration that we gradually underflow the numbers to zero. In this form, the number in the mantissa is no longer in scientific notation. It's no longer normalized. It's been denormalized. And that's where the name for these numbers come from, denormals or subnormals. In this special case, the exponent still stays at 2 to the power of negative 126. It doesn't drop in value. Right. Let's see what the lowest possible subnormal number is. It's when the exponent is all zeros and the mantissa is one on the least significant bit. Yeah, this makes sense, right? Let's find out what the value is in decimal. We can manually calculate this or let a program calculate it for us. Let's go back to the program. In the numeric limits class, we previously got the minimum normalized value but we can also get the minimum denormalized value as well. Let's print that out.
there are two really important facts that we can get out of this. One, the difference between the two lowest normalized numbers, or rather the lowest precision value that we can get, is the exact same as the lowest denormalized number. This is quite profound once you realize that the subtraction between two non-zero, non-equal numbers will always be non-zero. Still very cryptic, but in simpler terms, it can be mathematically proven that subtracting two distinct floating point numbers will never give you zero in a calculation. It will always give you some result. This result may not always be accurate, but it will give you a result nonetheless. The second point to note is that the lowest denormalized number is about seven orders of magnitude lower than the lowest normalized number. How is this possible? What kind of witchcraft is this? How are numbers stored accurately within this huge range within one window of numbers? The answer is they're not. The accuracy of subnormal numbers is abysmal. It's really bad and shouldn't really be compared with floating point accuracy. Let me demonstrate this. I'll take the number 1.4 times 10 to the power of negative 38 and I'll multiply this number by 1.5. This is well within the normalized range of numbers, so we should expect to get decent accuracy here. So 1.4 times 1.5 is 2.1, so we're expecting some number close to that. We can see that the result is 2.1, followed by a few zeros and some inaccurate numbers right after that. So it's accurate to about seven decimal places. And this is totally expected for floating point format. 2.1 cannot be expressed exactly in binary, and the accuracy is acceptable, I guess. What about this number? 1.4 times 10 to the power of negative 45. Now, this is very close to the lowest subnormal number. Let's multiply this by 1.5. You can see 1.4 itself is stored not so accurately here, but what about the result? Good golly, Miss Molly, it's 2.8. <laughs> it's not even close to accurate. What went wrong? 2.8. What can we infer from this? It's 2 times 1.4. So it's twice the number we asked for. This is also the second smallest subnormal number. So no values between these two numbers can be represented in this format. What's the third largest number then? Well, it's 3 times 1.4. What does this remind you of? Clearly, the subnormal numbers are arranged in fixed point format. It's like asking what's 1.5 times 1 in integer. Well, we know that the answer will be 2 because 2 is the nearest number to 1 in integer fixed point, and the answer is rounded off. The same thing is happening here. So we find that the floating point format is a real oddity. It's full of interesting nuances. A large portion of the numbers, normalized numbers, are logarithmically spaced out with floating point representation and precision. And then a small subset of numbers, denormalized numbers, are linearly spaced out with fixed point representation. Because of the subnormal oddball, it's quite difficult to implement operations on subnormals within the hardware floating point unit. Some of the processors do it directly in hardware but a lot of them delegate the handling of subnormal numbers to system software. This will most definitely cause performance penalties for applications that are computing subnormal numbers. Floating point calculations, which could have been done in a couple of clock cycles in hardware, could take as many as 100 additional clock cycles to complete when it's delegated to the system software, and it can't, and it can't be done directly within hardware. There is more to talk about regarding subnormal numbers. This is one of the more controversial additions to the IEEE 754 specification. Not everybody were on the same side of the argument. Logically and mathematically, it makes sense. And in an idealistic world, it makes the format more robust and resilient. But for reasons I can't fathom, they are a nightmare for hardware chip designers and for practically implementing them. We'll definitely revisit subnormal numbers when we talk about problems associated with floating point numbers. But till then, let's carry on.